Welcome to episode 18 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new perspectives to some of our favorite games. And with that said, let's get going. Our first little adventure is going to take place in the Mystic Ruins, and as you can see here we are left with an invisible wall and oh boy are there a lot of them. So <laughs> let's see what's in front of this visible wall. So clearly we're going through some train tracks here, and obviously, but at the end of the tunnel it's just a black wall. But the stage doesn't end there. If you take the camera through it you can actually see that there's an outside area. And then when you turn the camera around, you can see that all the textures in Sonic Adventure are rendered on both sides. Which is a little bit unusual because, well, I mean I've been doing about 18 episodes of this show now and I've never seen so many environments textured on both sides like this, at least not this consistently. Uh, but anyways, so that's where the train tracks end and if you look down below, there's some outer layers of the cavern areas that you use in order to get to the Chow Garden. And when trying to see if there was anything under the water, I accidentally stumbled upon these blocks. Now I had to play for the entirety of Sonic Adventure for the very first time, mind you. I actually liked it. And at no point do these blocks ever pop up, but I found it very interesting. And if you're wondering what's behind those blocks, that is a launching bay for Tails Airplane. Better get going. Okay, so now we're going to check out Tails House. Now, on the bottom door, you can actually go in there. It's very small and very cramped and not much is going on inside, but you can go in there. On the second floor though, there's a door that doesn't open. Even if you have Tails who can reach the door, it will not open for you. So what's inside? Well, when we get inside here, we can actually see that... <laughs> Tails has a very uncomfortable living space. He just lives with a giant rotating gear, and uh, his chimney stack doesn't work. But what's actually really interesting about the chimney stack is that they rendered something to make it look like it was the bottom of a chimney but you can never see it because if you were to ever to actually get on top of the roof and look down the chimney, the roof just clips through the chimney. So that's all you're actually allowed to see. But anyways, nice house tales. It's out in the middle of nowhere. You have no neighbors, no friends, and no bed. So we finally met our first encounter with Dr. Robotnik. Nope. And there's actually a couple interesting things about him. For one thing, he's uh, he's got no legs. Poor guy's got no legs. And actually, he has a really weird texture below his uh, his waistline. Um, that's not his usual costume design. I'm not exactly sure what they were going for with the bottom torso. Maybe someone else can tell me. Oh my god, I just figured it out. It's, uh, it's this texture that's on the front of his ship. EG1. It's just blown up. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's actually really cool. You developers, you sure do like to have some fun sometimes. And also, behind his glasses, does he have eyes? Well, uh, no. He, he has jack-o'-lantern eyes. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Dr. Robotnik is a descendant of a pumpkin, or the Pumpkin King. And here is another invisible wall. Is it starting to make sense why Sonic smacked into an invisible wall at the beginning of this episode? I hope so. Well, this time it's a car garage. Cars go in, cars go out, but you're not allowed to see where they go or what's inside. Well, we are going to change that right now. And now you know that the reason for that is that the developers didn't want to render a garage. Makes sense. Oh man, this, this part of the game is totally rad. I kind of want to stop playing it, but for the sake of actually working this into the episode, how about we take a look at what it looks like from a different angle. From this angle, you get a much better look at the all-consuming avalanche. And as you can see, nothing survives what it devours. However, the avalanche in truth is a bit of a facade, a fake, a phony. If you position the camera far enough back, you can actually see that there isn't too much length to the avalanche itself. In fact, if anything, it looks more like a Kamehameha beam. <laughs> but I'm not here to speculate. So now, so now Sonic's running down a building, because Sonic is insane, and you gotta ask yourself, what does it look like when you zoom the building out? Well, there's two sections, one that we're looking at right now, where it's indoors, and this is what that looks like. And then there's another where it's outdoors, and this is what that looks like. 
Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, this is my first time playing through Sonic Adventure, and what the hell, dude? Uh, <laughs> gravestones inside of a lava area? What? That's dark. I don't even understand. What, like, none of this level has a theme of like graves and stuff. I'm sorry. That's that's not boundary breaky. Uh, so let's give this area a little bit of boundary breaking relevance. Seriously, what's up with those graves? So. Over here is a pumping machine of some sort, and I thought it was kind of neat, so I thought that maybe we could do a little bit of a tour through it. I really hope this interests you, viewer, because, I mean, I'm sorry, there's just no other way for me to talk about the <laughs> those graves! There has to be some kind of backstory. So we just landed on Dr. Robotnik's humongous ship, and it's, well, humongous. <laughs> you want to take a look? It's huge, dude. It's insane. Sonic is just a speck at this point. The ship is so massive that in HD, you cannot see Sonic anymore. This ship is too much. So this room has three bays that roll out uh, drum, drum cans, I think. And I thought it'd be really interesting to take the camera inside of the bay doors. But what actually ended up being way more interesting is that just outside of these bays, is a room of circuitry made up of a texture that you can't see anywhere else in the game and serves no purpose than to just add to the believability that this is a real ship. So now we're at Dr. Robotnik's trash chute and there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes out of said trash chute. There's different colored sandals for one thing, which, uh, okay. But there's also a tire, a girder, a globe, and most interestingly, a robot maid. <laughs> you do get to see this robot maid later on, but it's just funny that this is one of the things that gets tossed out with the trash. Or did it toss itself out by accident? You yeah. know, something to think about. Okay, so now we are inside Dr. Robotnik's base. Sorry if you wanted some commentary a moment ago, I just uh, felt like my voice wouldn't have added to the epicness of that clip, so forgive me. <laughs> Moving on! So here are some creepy dolls for seemingly no reason. I love Sonic, but man, sometimes the series can be really weird. And just before we encounter Dr. Robotnik one more time, I figured we could take a look on the outer portions of his base area. Now I can make an entire episode dedicated to just taking the camera outside of a room and showing how awesome the level layout looks in every single stage. But instead I opted to show a little bit of that here near the end of the game, mostly because it's one of the cooler looking ones. Peach moment? Are you kidding? 
Oh my god, he looked... It's terrifying! Oh my god, he looks so bad. And this isn't a cutscene! We're meant to be looking at Robotnik right now. Oh dear lord. <laughs> Okay, so we're at the very end of the game, and we have just turned supersonic, and, uh, is there anything we can show off here to bookend this episode? Absolutely. So, obviously, the city submerged in water. It looks very, very elaborate. But how elaborate is it really? When we zoom out the camera, we can see that there's only enough buildings to really wall you off. No 2D buildings, no additional buildings to just kind of pad out the scenery. Just enough buildings to make sure that you're on course to fight chaos. I'm really shocked by this because while playing the last scenario and seeing the final cutscenes of the game, they really do give you this amazing, amazing vibe that, that you're surrounded by a city. Kudos to the Sonic team. This is grade A minimalism. Sonic? ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. With that said, let's get going. So we have three scenes before we even start the game. It's crazy. And the first thing I wanted to show you guys is that there's actually pilots inside the cockpits. I, I couldn't believe it. But I think what happened here was that the developers were not happy with the textures that they used for the pilots, because they're, they're really, they actually are kind of shoddy. And what they did for a quick fix was that they tinted the windows. And the other thing that I wanted to show you guys was the interior of the helicopter. Now what's interesting about this is that there's actually a specific room made specifically for that one scene where Sonic breaks out. Now the rest of the helicopter is just a double-sided texture, which makes that little cube space even funnier. So that one scene before we actually start the game is that Sonic is actually pressed up against the hatch door before he escapes. And he has a big dopey look on his face the entire time. And what's even funnier about this is that when he finally does escape, it just looks like he's getting sucked out. Later, dude. Next up is the level City Escape, and we're going to be doing a lot of the viewer favorite zoom outs. So when we zoom out City Escape, you can see that the buildings are mostly rendered. This kind of makes sense because the roofs need to be textured and modeled, because you can see them as you're sliding down in the distance. But you'll notice that on the sides and in the back, there's nothing there. This is to save on memory, of course. In fact, I was kind of hoping to see some things down the streets whenever there was a four point. But unfortunately, those streets end very quickly as well. In fact, it looks like the developers smartened up quite a bit, because in Sonic Adventure 1, they didn't have all this culling. Everything was rendered at once. So much to the benefit of all of us, the developers incorporated all new memory saving techniques for Sonic Adventure 2. Will benefit to gamers as a whole, not so much for the show Boundary Break, because as you can see, culling can actually hide away things that are actually really hard to see or sometimes never seen by the player. But that's okay, we have a workaround for this episode because, well, as long as Sonic is in with eye shot of whatever scenery we're trying to look at, it'll appear. And we do have a modification to make sure that Sonic can go anywhere. Trust me. Here's a close-up of the F-61 pilot. Now, I know that's a little bit random, but this is one of those instances where the character is so negligible that you barely get to see him. And as a result, you also don't get to see his cockpit, which is also textured. And now we're gonna look at the Chow Garden. Why? Well, because so many people talked about the Chow Garden in the Sonic Adventure 1 episode. How could I possibly forget it this time? So for the Chow Garden itself, you can see there's not a whole lot to it, but I'm a man of my word. I'll also show you guys the skybox. Because the skyboxes in the Sonic Adventure games are particularly cool. Being that all the textures in these games are double sided, you can see the actual bubble that all these worlds exist in. Now much more interesting within the Chow Garden is the actual mini games that you play. There's unique environments made for each one and this one in particular is very detailed. And naturally it makes a lot of sense to just look at it from another perspective. Now unfortunately there isn't much to see except <laughs> Knuckles, you're right there. 
So now we're at Green Forest, and one of the really cool things about it is that, yeah, sure, the zoom out looks really nice, of course, but even better than that is that there's actually another set of trees outside of the skybox. This marks the second time I found something outside of a skybox in Boundary Break, so naturally, I'm gonna be looking outside of it a lot more often. So here's a fun little tidbit that I've been putting off for a long time. Did you know that cutscenes in three-dimensional games are typically in a 3D space? Yeah, so essentially when you see a pre-rendered cutscene, it's very likely that it's actually being played out in a 3D area. And since this is boundary break, I can actually manipulate the camera around the cutscene and look at it from different angles. It's kind of a shame that we can't go into pre-rendered stuff, but this is still interesting in its own right. <laughs> now that was a pre-rendered cutscene. However, in-game cutscenes are another deal. So in this scene with a limousine, oh, <laughs> that was fun to say. We have the president talking to Dr. Eggman. But if we move the camera outside the limousine, you can see what it really looks like. And I gotta admit, I've never really seen a limousine that looks quite like this. Otherwise. Otherwise. So now we're at Pyramid Cave, and this is one of those stages where the environment's really interesting. One of the things you hardly ever get to see with Tails is the ancient statues. Yes, you get to see them with Dr. Robotnik, but it's usually at night, so this is how they look with better lighting. And another cool thing too is, those pyramids in the background, what do you think they are? You think they're a 2D texture? They certainly look like it. Well, I bet you'd be interested to find out that they're actually pseudo 3D. Yeah, for some reason, despite the fact that it's so far off in the distance, the developers actually decide to give them some polygons. Which I find odd, because this is clearly a printed image. And whenever you see realistic stuff in video games, I tend to only see them as 2D textures. So it's really cool. And now we're fighting the ghost boss. And man, what a pathetic looking ghost. But zooming in on this guy revealed something to me. Any character with a round eyeball actually has the retina texture on the opposite side as well. So the texture occupies half a sphere and then it's duplicated on the opposite side to make a full sphere. So this was absolutely nuts. I'm in one of these hallways for the space station level and I zoom the camera out to see that the green binary matrixy code stuff is covering all the rooms. And my only hope is that YouTube's video compression doesn't ruin this scene because it looks amazing. And actually it became very apparent to me that this entire stage has a lot of effort put into it. Like for example this one tower that Tails goes to, it's massive. And for some reason, it's not called out whatsoever. If we drop far enough away, Tails is microscopic, which caused my jaw to drop. And the other thing I wanted to look at is these tubes that Sonic goes through. There's these walls with unique detail to them, and it just looks so good to stop the game and just admire the design. So this scene is comedy gold. I was playing out this cutscene where Tails just defeated Dr. Eggman, and while Tails is distracted talking to Sonic, Dr. Eggman grabs the emerald and essentially causes mischief after that. But when we point the camera at all of Dr. Eggman in this cutscene, I got no words. It's the best. It's one of the funniest things I've seen on this show. <laughs> so there's no way that we could have left out Maria. And why are we taking a look at Maria right now? Well... Remember when I told you that all characters with round eyeballs have textures on both sides? Well, it's time to back up that claim. So when we take the camera into the back of Maria's head, we can actually see that there are two eyeball textures on the round sphere. And it actually and it looks absolutely ridiculous on Maria. And you increase the death chamber. So what better way to end the episode than with Super Sonic and Super Shadow? Is that, we're, is that what we're supposed to call them? Anyways, in this brief moment you can actually see Sonic and Shadow flying up through this weird particle effect and then they suddenly transform into Super Sonic and Super Shadow. But if we take the camera below them, you can actually see that Super Sonic and Super Shadow are sitting there waiting. And if we take the camera even further down, we can see that their bodies are all deformed and scrunched up. And so the way they pulled this off, and this is really cool, if you slow the game down to a crawl, you can see that the models are actually swapping with each other at a really fast speed. Faster than Sonic the Hedgehog himself. And this is essentially when they've transformed. So when we take the camera down below Super Sonic and Super Shadow, we can see regular Sonic and regular Shadow now down below. I'm just kidding. There is one last thing I want to show you, and that is that 
in the ending credits and this final screen with Shadow the Hedgehog, you can actually see Master Hand and Crazy Hand. I know it's not really them, but please, I want to believe. And one thing I can't explain whatsoever is that there's like a white rectangle in between the two hands. I mean, I can probably guess that the hands are there because there needs to be a character model present, but the white rectangle, I have no idea. Haven't got a clue. Everybody, welcome to episode 68 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. A couple weeks ago, I actually replaced this episode with Sonic Mania, and while a lot of you appreciated that, there was an equal number of people that were wondering where this episode was. And well, it's time to finally deliver on the promise of this episode. So, big thank you to MC94 for making this week's animated intro, and with that said, let's get going. So the first area that we want to look at is the first area of the game, Seaside Hill. And one of the biggest teases in Sonic Heroes is the fact that a lot of the times when you start a stage, your character runs down a certain area that later becomes inaccessible. So we're just going to take the camera over to see if there's anything behind the hill. And apparently, it's not even called out in the back, it's simply not rendered at all. I was able to fact check this by taking the characters there themselves. And since the environment didn't appear when it was in Sonic's view, then it means it's not even hidden by culling. And also, that bridge that falls down so that you can't get back to this area is still in the water. But by far the oddest thing is that the texture used on the bottom half of the skybox has a whole bunch of black circles. Now, at first I thought this was really unusual, but if you take the camera far enough up into the sky, the entire environment disappears except for a circle, which is incredibly similar to what this texture looks like. So it's my belief that the developers actually just took a picture of the environment from this height and then copied and pasted it into the skybox that you see now. Next up is a zoom out of this vehicle segment with a normal perspective in the corner. One of the great things about this particular zoom out is that it's largely unaffected by the culling that is ever present in this game. And although I say that, you can actually still see some of it in large portions of the map. And before we end Act 1, I wanted to do a zoom out of the whale that is at the very end of the stage. I actually ended up showing a picture of this early on Twitter and a lot of people didn't even know that what you're standing on at the very end of this stage is in fact the whale that you see off in the distance. But whether or not you had a keen eye in the first place, it's still really nice to see this entire area in one shot. This place would make a great vacation spot. While staying on the subject of aquatic creatures, I figured we could take a look at these sea turtles from Ocean Palace. One of the most unique aspects of this future act of the first zone is that you have to start platforming off of these sea turtles. But not only do the sea turtles have a lot of detail that you're not really given a great chance to look at, but doing a zoom out of this area is pretty special as well. Next up is another look at Dr. Robotnik, or Dr. Eggman if you prefer the retcon. And every single time I cover a Sonic the Hedgehog game, I just want to see if there's anything underneath those glasses, but like every time, it's a, a huge disappointment and of course there's nothing there. But this time around, Dr. Eggman's got something a little bit more going on inside of his head. Apparently the goggles that rest on top of his egg-shaped dome drive deep into his skull into a cone shape. This technique was also used on the Animal Crossing episode that I covered, as well as the Mario Kart 8 episode with the Koopa Rocks. Next up is a full zoom out of Grand Metropolis. This was a very popular viewer request, mostly because anytime that there's a metropolis in any video game, people want to know just how much of that city there actually is. And in a game like Sonic Heroes, we can restructure the question to be, how much is being done to hide how small the metropolis actually is? And in Sonic Heroes' case, the second that you go outside of any of the buildings that you can initially see, not only is there no back end to these buildings, but there's no buildings behind them either. And also one other little thing we wanted to look at before we move on, is the cars. A lot of cars are flying around in the background, but you don't really get a good look at them. But by pausing the game and zooming up to them, we can see that they actually have a low level of detail. Now let's take an outside perspective on one of the many half pipes used in Sonic Heroes. 
Now jumping inside the cannon is a whole other story. See when the characters jump inside you're not allowed to see what's going on inside the cannon. Instead you just wait till the character is blown out of it. But if we take the camera through and see what's going on we can see that all three characters are stacked inside of each other and constantly spinning. Which is really fun to see because even in games where you are shot specifically out of a cannon, a lot of times the character just goes invisible while they're inside. But in Sonic Heroes, rest assured, the characters are perpetually spinning, waiting for you to end their dizziness and press a button. So now we're going to take a look at Casino Zone, or Casino Park for those who are actually paying attention, and we're going to start off by doing a zoom out of one of the pinball areas, which is pretty neat in itself, but we're not going to end there. No, in fact, one of the things that we're going to look at is the skybox of this area, specifically the center point of the skybox. Now, in most skyboxes, an identical image typically meets all into one area, and it usually doesn't look that great. But here in Casino Park, the developers decide to do something a little bit sneaky, a little bit clever. And for the center of Casino Park, they actually made a roulette wheel. And why a roulette wheel is particularly clever is because if you take one fourth of a roulette wheel and piece it together three more times, it looks pretty convincing. And so to match the casino motif, while at the same time also appealing to the limitations of what a skybox usually amounts to, we get a pretty fun centerpiece to it. So here on Egg Fleet, there are a ton of ships out in the air. However, this is a PlayStation 2 era type game. So to have so many objects going on at once is probably a good indication that there is some resource saving techniques used in this level. And regular viewers of the show probably know what's going on here. We got ourselves a 2D texture to represent some of the furthest away ships in this level. With the aid of standard definition and lots of fog, it's a little more difficult to catch the fact that these ships have no 3D models whatsoever. And the ones that do have really simple geometry. Another pretty big viewer request is seeing where the frogs go after they do their little rain dance. And unfortunately the results of that aren't as quite as exciting as you would hope. But in the process of checking it out you can actually see the filter used to make it look like it's raining outside. Which is not too shabby. But as for the frog itself, well, it only disappears. Nothing too exciting there. Oh, this one's really special. In this segment, Sonic is riding on a growing vine. So as you're sliding down this vine, it's growing with the character. But if we zoom the camera out, we can actually see that the vine is not connected at all. In fact, it kind of travels with the character instead of growing with the character. And then the texture on the vine is animated to make it look like it's growing. Hardly anything in game design is ever as easy as it looks. Like for example, this film roll that's in this menu here. It's not simply a looping animation, it's actually a part of this HUD that exists in our 3D space. And the texture used to make this film reel is just one object that actually just repeats position, but it's done so seamlessly that the players are not able to even notice. Now inside Mystic Mansion, we got our little skeleton buddies over here. And one of the things that's really odd about these guys is that if you approach them, they decide to hide behind whatever it was they popped out of, and you'll see that they're not there anymore. So obviously, we gotta take the camera over to see what's going on exactly, and the first thing I wanna know is, is there anything else to these skeletons? And unfortunately, no. Pretty much everything that you get to see out of the skeletons is what you get. And as you could probably imagine, the second that they decide to hide behind whatever it was that they came out of, they just immediately disappear. People are probably gonna mention the fact that there's multiple multiple skeletons in this one stage, so I do want to show you at least one more example of pretty much the same result except in a different area just so that you guys know for sure. And now we're going to do a zoom out of the funky liquid room and oh boy I cannot wait to see how YouTube's compression messes up this scene. But whether or not YouTube decides that my video is now going to be a series of chunky pixels, you will see the fact that these particular rooms are actually completely encapsulized in a giant sphere, a large portion of which the player will never be able to see. And of course at the very end of Mystic Mansion we got ourselves a zoom out of the outdoor area right at the goal. You can see a bed of flowers that hugs the arena of the map that would normally be a lot more difficult to see.
So a word of warning, this camera is incredibly difficult to use. I was able to get a lot of really great shots, but it doesn't work in every single area, and in the areas that it does work, uh, my god is it difficult to control. But something as minute as that doesn't deter me. The fact that matters most is that it does work. But I am giving you this disclaimer why you're not going to be able to see everything the game has to offer. So as you can see right now we're doing a zoom out of Green Hill Zone on the classic stage. And let's see what else Green Hill Zone has to hide. Next up is the item boxes, and you might have noticed in your normal playthrough that these objects inside of the boxes look a little bit 3D. Well, whether or not you were thinking about it or not, here's a good perspective on how it actually looks from another angle, which confirms that it is 100% 3D, including items like the 1UP box. It uses a technique very similar to how it works with Mr. Game & Watch in Super Smash Bros. Melee and Onward, where the model is in fact 3D, but it's squished really tight. This is evidenced by the fact that if you take the camera behind the Sonic head, you can see that there's still some smush 3D geometry on the other side. Here we got the Choppers, a Sonic staple from the very first game. And from another angle you can see how they actually operate. See instead of going up and down they're actually on a looping track. And you might notice that at any given time they seem to always be visible. This is because they have layer priority over anything else in the game. Aside from the HUD itself of course. Meaning even if it's technically below the bridge, it'll still show up because it's programmed to always be in the front. That is of course unless it actually moves into the background, at which point the layer priority is changed. And instead of a zoom out, here's an alternate perspective of classic Sonic running through the stage. Hey, so how about that hub world? Even if you're modern Sonic, you can't manipulate the camera in any sort of way, so this is a little bit of a tree here. Moving the camera around proves that there isn't just a walk mesh for Sonic to stand on. That white ground you're running on is technically a texture, which is evidenced by the fact that you can see shadows bouncing off of the environment when you move in in a different way, which is great because we can actually see just how high up the wall goes in the backdrop before it just stops and you're just looking at the void behind it. Also, there's some really fun stuff to look at inside the hub world. Like for example, the killer whale over here seems to jump in and out of the water in the background, but if we take the camera below the water surface, you can see that old Willy over here just stops animating once he's underneath the ground, but he stays there for all of us to see his frozen character model. Also, we can get a much better look at the pinball machine that's in the hub area and see how much it really stacks against the actual pinball machine that you end up going into when you select it. And you got me, this is definitely a segue to the pinball machine area. Zooming out the camera for the pinball area is really surprising. I know that there's a backdrop that you're supposed to be able to kind of see, but to what length they actually went to and how little of it you end up seeing in the final game is shocking. There's all sorts of fun buildings and signs that you couldn't see otherwise. And that's of course a great thing to find in a show like this, but also just the little things are kind of special too, like just seeing the pinball machine from a different angle. Again, a very restricted camera that points in very certain directions. This next segment is a viewer request from Twitter, which was asked by a fellow YouTuber, NitroRad. And what he's always wondered is, when you're going down the big railing down the clock tower in Rooftop Run, you see like a bazillion houses all at once. And the question is, how do they end up rendering all of those houses? Well, of course, most of these houses have a low polygon count, despite the fact that they have pretty decent textures on them. But it doesn't take long before these houses go from polygon models and instead become completely flat textures representing houses. Though I feel like this would be completely unnecessary if they just did one thing, and that is take out this whole other layer of houses that you're not allowed to see, because just for the fun of it, there is a whole other area where there's a whole bunch of low poly houses, completely outside of the player's view. View. And of course, we gotta do a zoom out of the area itself so that you can see just how stupidly huge the rooftop rung clock tower is. It's um, absurdly big compared to the other buildings.
right, so let's talk about our first boss, the Death Egg. And inside the hangar of the Death Egg, it's really surprising how much is going on in the background that you will not be able to see whatsoever. There's some space trains that are flying around in the backdrop, but it's hard to tell that they're actually coming out of the station itself. And even better than that is if we take the camera outside of the hangar, you can see the entire planet as well as a whole lot of flying trains riding around off camera. Now this discovery was something I found completely by accident. I accidentally stumbled upon it while filming an intro. But if we take the camera inside of Classic Sonic's face, you can see that it looks like he has a pair of big lips inside of his head. Well don't worry, it's nothing that shocking. What's stored inside of Sonic's head at any given time for some reason is his eyelids. This will become more apparent very soon and I'll show you why. But before we move on to that explanation, I just want to show you that he also has his mouth awkwardly stored to the left of his head. Because it's no surprise to anyone that Sonic's mouth is not in the front of his face, but just seeing it in 3D and knowing that the inside of his mouth is skewed off to a different direction than the front of his face makes this anomaly even more odd. But anyways, the reason why I was able to figure out that these were his eyelids is because if we go over to modern Sonic, you can see that he has blue eyelids in the back of his head. Once I saw that, I was able to piece it together and realize Realize, oh, that's right, Classic Sonic has skin colored eyelids. Let's take a look at Seaside Hill. Now with modern Sonic, pretty much in every single stage that he does, he gets a running start and you're not allowed to see what's behind him after the player's in control of Sonic. And in Seaside Hill, they give you a little bit of the environment behind Sonic to see before the level starts up. But taking the camera over there can show you that there's quite a bit of environment that they don't allow you to see whatsoever. Like for example, some of this grass and trees are never seen by the player. And funny enough, the bridge that drops at the start behaves the exact same way as it did in the Sonic Heroes episode, where it just sits there underneath the water. Now for Seaside Hill in general, we got two zoom outs to do here. One at the start of the level so you can see how it looks here versus how it looked in the Sonic Heroes episode that I did, as well as a zoom out for the end of the stage because these buildings are pretty massive despite the scope that the game allows you to see. City Escape is a lot of fun to look at in the same way that Rooftop Run is. If we zoom the camera out, we can see that the city buildings have a consecutive pattern of squares. And wow, how many buildings there are, I couldn't even tell you. There are so many here. They may have actually outdone Rooftop Run. So no, there is no shocking revelation here with Perfect Chaos, it's just that we can take the camera wherever we want in this scene, thankfully, and uh, yeah, I just want to show you an amazing zoom out of a pretty well made boss. One more scene behind Sonic when he starts a level that I wanted to show you guys is in Crisis City. In some of the cases of these stages, there seems to be some evidence that you were allowed to see the back end of the stage at some point. Because here in Crisis City, when we turn the camera around to the barricaded areas, you can see two toppled buildings that are very unique to themselves. A piece of environment that's never seen by the player. A quick disclaimer, you're not going to see all the stages, you're not going to see the ending of the game, but there are some minor gameplay elements that are considered spoilers to some people for the early stages of the game. So if you're alright with that, let's talk about these fish. Right at the start of the game, you can see that these enemies jump right out of the water and try to snap at Sonic. But the question is, where do they go when they go off screen? Well, by some miracle, we can actually take the camera up above the screen and see a mirrored environment that involves these fish. And when we take a look from down below, we can actually see that the fish do not just disappear and instead literally travel a certain distance downward before springing back up onto the screen. 
So even though this debug is about as legit as a Fisher-Price toy acting as a real piano, it actually does reveal some really cool stuff. Like for example here, it's actually showing you the triggers that your character walks through to change what layer of the environment you're on. See, when you pass through BL, it actually switches you to the background layer, allowing you to pass through the loop-to-loop. -loop. But alternatively, if a character passes through the AL, it now means you're on the advanced layer, which essentially means you're about as much in the foreground as the game allows. There's actually many other symbols, like for example right here, it says AH. Its purpose seems to allow Sonic to interact with any objects that are destructible or any type of hazard, I suppose. But as for what the initials actually stand for, I'm not quite sure. I actually did try to reach out to Christian Whitehead on Twitter about this and I got no response back, so feel free to give me the answer down below. Now like I said, the debug option is very limited. The developers clearly wanted to add this in as a feature without revealing too much of the game's inner workings. But with enough manipulation, you can actually see things like this platform here moving up and down in the foreground as one object. Now this is one of the things I wish I didn't have to show you guys, but I found something really cool within it, so I... Sorry. <laughs> but the reason why I'm showing you this particular boss fight is because when you defeat Eggman, you see him drop through the ground. And normally when you defeat a boss in Sonic Mania, even with the debug menu, they lock the screens to make sure that you can't see what's going on outside the boundaries. But on this boss fight, if we move far enough left and the environment goes far enough down, the camera will pan down with it. And then the camera won't move on its own unless the player activates a trigger that tells the camera to move up into position. So if we lower the camera position during a lower part of the environment and move it back to the boss fight after we defeated Eggman, we can actually see his defeated sprite hanging in the air. Another cool thing too is that if we move the character inside the Mean Bean Arena, placing that character will actually crumble the ground underneath them. So I cannot stress this enough. The debug option tries to hide as much content as possible while at the same time allowing some fun to the player. So it's a huge surprise to me to see that you can actually move the camera up during the first boss fight. But not only that, there's a ceiling for some reason. But the player would never be able to see this. In fact, this ceiling goes all the way up to the top of the map. And if the player were able to get to the very top, they could actually run around up there. Unfortunately, I can't do a zoom out for Sonic Mania, but I am impressed by one thing in particular, and that is that if there were a zoom out for this map, every waterfall and bridge properly connects to make an organic environment so that it would look great if you were to zoom out the map. Like for example, these waterfalls you've been looking at have a start and a finish, including this one that you would never be able to see is actually connected to two different areas. If you were to be on the upper path, you could see the waterfall starting from underneath the bridge, but if you ended up taking the lower path, you can see that that waterfall extends all the way downward to the bottom of the screen. Using the same technique that we did for the Dr. Robotnik fight, we can actually see that the mini-boss in Chemical Plant Act 1 has a lot of environment that goes from underneath the stage. And since we were starting from the bottom, we can now see that the boss was maneuvering through a pool similar to the ones that are used to turn into gelatin in Act 2. One little sneaky trick that the game developers tried to pull off here is that in Act 2 of Green Hill Zone, they wanted to have two different backgrounds. When you're on the bottom layer, they wanted to have it have like a cave-like background, and on the top layer, they wanted to show some mountains with some giant totem poles. But if we manipulate the camera down below the stage when it's not intended to be, you can actually see the bottom of the totem pole background. But once the game realizes that you're down here, it blips the intended background. So a moment ago I was telling you how the environment pretty much connects organically and if it were to be zoomed out it would all look like it was connected together. However there is one blemish that the developers tried to hide from you. On these really long bridges there are these unique bridge connectors that hold one bridge to another. However scaling the cameras from the bottom up shows that these connectors don't go all the way down to the bottom of the map. And while there is quite a bit more of this object than the player is allowed to see, it just doesn't quite reach the bottom. Act 1 of Studiopolis, there's something very odd here. For one thing, the walls don't trap the character, and that's something that typically happens when you place a character inside the walls of Sonic Mania. However, here, they just drop. But what's even more intriguing is that the posters that are supposed to be placed on top of these walls actually act as platforms. If we were to place a character on top of those, you can see that not only does the character stand on it, but they can push it as well. And I guess we can take this time to talk about the Dr. Robotnik icons. Now, like I said a second ago, the characters tend to get trapped in the walls, but you could jump to scale whatever wall 
wall you're stuck in. However, these Dr. Robotnik icons are meant to either A, push the player out of the way, or B, kill the player outright. This is to prevent the player from exploiting the game and doing some really cheap tricks like running across the ceiling. You don't get to have any World 1-2 shenanigans from Super Mario Brothers in this game. In fact, that Dr. Robotnik icon actually goes past the boundaries of the screen. Therefore, if you were to actually get on top of the roof, you wouldn't be able to get back down. There's no educational purpose for this, I just thought it was too precious not to share. Right at the start of Hydro City, we got ourselves a wall on the left hand side. Now normally the walls have no surprises, and so it gets to a point where if you find anything at all, it's worth at least a mention. So when we get to the very start of the map, which is in the upper left hand corner, we can actually see that there's just one square of green stone instead of this typical orange. And interestingly enough, that is the same brick that's used in the backdrop of when you're underwater, just without the aquatic effects. And over here, outside of the water, it functions just like the wall does, trapping the player and not allowing any free movement. Lava Reef Zone is just one of those stages where it just impresses me how deep the lava goes. I mean, there's really no reason why the lava needs to go this deep. Even if you were to hold down to just try to see how deep it goes, it still doesn't show you everything that the lava has to offer. Although, admittingly, because you weren't supposed to see the bottom of the lava pit, it, it uh, doesn't really look so high. It doesn't really blend with those rocks too well. Although, a funny little tidbit here, apparently, if you were to get underneath the lava pit, the only part of the lava that will actually hurt your character is the surface of the lava. Everything else is A-OK. -okay. There's also an S symbol, and when the player touches the S symbol, it automatically turns them into a spin. Another set of strange unused level tiles are resting above the mini boss room in Lava Reef. If you were to go above the ceiling, you could see that there's a whole lot of lava that's completely unused and just 100% in the shape of a square, but that also stops just shy of the ceiling as well. In fact, the level of freedom here is so unusual that you can actually see a prop used to advance to the next stage, which is something that's typically barred off once you reach the boss area. Now, although the game tells you that there's only two, there's technically three zones to Lava Reef, according to the debug menu. And in the third act, you end up fighting one of two bosses. Now, I'm not going to show you those bosses. You can get to that point in the game on your own. What I'm here to show you is what's beyond those boss rooms. And boy, is it strange. We got ourselves an unused platforming segment with very unusual walls with glitch tiles. It looks like at one point it was meant to be a window into something, but uh, now it's just home to a bunch of random wall sprites. But surprisingly, it doesn't even end there. In fact, you can tell that it was a very intense area because of the way that the environment's set up. You have to jump up a couple blocks and then you end up on a cliff side. And if you take your player across that, you can actually see that there's a cliff on the other side. But after that, it's done. We're out of map to put stuff on. You know, unless you did the goal sign glitch. Now, what's the gold sign glitch? Well, let me tell you all about it. See, I'll say this for the third and final time. The debug option in Sonic Mania is not all the tools that the developers had at their disposal, by no means. And what they left in the game for the players is kind of like a child's toy. It's just supposed to be a little bit of fun, but you don't get the level of tools that the developers had, otherwise you'd be able to go through any wall you want or go through any floor. But one oversight that they made in their debug mode is that if the goalpost is halfway off screen, you can still move the camera left and right. This is because the goalpost demands the game the center of the camera on it. Here in Studiopolis, you can see that there's a whole track behind the start of the zone. Now, don't get too excited. We're basically looking at the mini boss platforms without the correct background. And if you were to do this in other levels, like the one I just mentioned earlier, you usually just get a random placement of platforms. Though I gotta admit, although they look randomly placed, they do look like they could be used, but unfortunately, if you were to go into player mode, you'd fall right through. Really, she says you're not going to show us what's beyond that cliffside? Don't worry, man. I got your back. Now, I told you, there's really just not a whole lot to see here, but I totally understand the value of ruining someone's imagination. By the way, if you want to use the debug mode at home, all you got to do is just hold down Y at the title screen and then press B. Feel free to let me know what you find. And also, if this is your first time here at my channel, I do have a Sonic Adventure 2 episode that's a lot more comprehensive, so I got a link to it in the video description down below.
Kicking it off with the first stage here, and it becomes a challenge to decide what to show you for an episode like this because there's so many restricted camera angles in a Sonic game usually. But I'll try to show you guys as many examples as I can, like here with Green Hill Zone. You do get to see a lot of environment before the rest of it's called out, and the way it works here in Sonic Forces is depending on the character position is what determines what area of the map is called out. Lots of games like to use something called occlusion culling, which disables the rendering of environments depending on what the camera is pointed at. But since it's Sonic and the camera is controlled pretty much at all times the culling works in chunks and since we're here at the first stage let's take a look at this sandworm lots of weird things going on with this guy I would have imagined that the worm was just one solid object but the developers went in a different direction here a lot of the parts of the body of the worm that don't have the face attached to it turn into donuts whereas the parts with the face seem to abruptly end Just like Sonic Generations, it seems as though that when a character starts a stage, there's a little bit of extra stage that's used for a cutscene, if you can even call it that. But since you can never spin the camera to see what's going on, I have to check for myself. And unlike Sonic Generations, which I will link to down below, there's a lot less to see outside of the starting zones in Sonic Forces. It seems that developers have kind of smartened up a little bit and didn't waste too much time with some additional environments. Though if we were to take the camera below the ocean or pool of chemicals, I'm not sure what they were trying to go for here. You can see a large portion of the skybox completely unused. And also we have a viewer request. As always, you can follow me on there to find out what episode I'm doing next, as well as offer suggestions for what I should look at, or send me OC says fan art if you choose. Anyways, they wanted me to take a look at the launching area for all these airships. And it is very massive and detailed, though it should be noted that they were able to pull this off pretty effectively by reusing a lot of assets that were already made for this area. Most of what you're looking at here are identical versions of the same ship. This one goes out to all the keyboard warriors out there. We got something kind of special that I missed in the Sonic Generations episode. When Classic Sonic completes a stage, he runs past a signpost that goes from Dr. Robotnik to a Classic Sonic that springs out of the sign. Now you might have been able to deduce this yourself, but both the front and back of the sign are made up of 3D models, just squished into the sign. And so if we were to look at Classic Sonic come out of the sign from another angle, it looks very interesting. Also, this is a great opportunity to show you what happens when you do complete a stage. As you know, you see your character on a results screen doing a pose, but did you know that that character model is not the same character model you used to complete the stage with? In fact, both character models can exist in the same plane of existence at any given time, like for example here with Classic Sonic. And also it's fun to point out that a lot more of the stage can be rendered at once when you're playing as Classic Sonic. Like with the stage that you've been looking at this whole time in this segment, nearly the entire stage can be shown in one shot. So you might notice from the thumbnail that Eggman looks like Gru from Despicable Me. <laughs> and the reason for this is because it was taken from a screenshot at a very specific angle in the game. At the end of chapter 24, if you take the camera over in front of Eggman, very specific angles of the camera will make his mustache disappear. As far as I can tell, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the game, it only seems to happen on this one chapter. Speaking of this chapter, let's take a look at some other things as well. Like the environment itself has a lot of indoor areas that you're not really given a good chance to look at, especially the ones that are way off in the background. But in many of these cases, they're fully furnished and most of these rooms are completely unique to themselves. Also, a cutscene that happens in this area is absolutely delightful. I love it. Off camera, you can see the OC character standing on top of the roof until he's supposed to be called in to help Sonic. And as the cutscene continues, the characters that are used in the scene are stored in various places depending on what's going on. Sometimes characters are stored well above the map, sometimes they're stored well inside the building. That seems to be the preferred case as you'll find most of the characters by the end of the cutscene all seem to chill around the same spot. So next up we're going to talk about Luminous Forest. And as for the environment itself, these luminous buildings seem to be really interesting. You take the camera around back to one of these and you can see that the back end of the building is fully modeled as well. And of course anyone who's played this game before knows that there's a giant snake that happens at some point in this level. And if we manipulate the camera during this scene you can see that the snake is not fully modeled. Though there isn't any reason why it ever should be because the developers cleverly made sure to point the camera at different angles that did not allow you to see the entire body of the snake. Now 
of course, a lot of people were asking me about Infinite and what does his face look like. Unfortunately, on Boundary Break, there's nothing I can really do in game. Taking the camera through Infinite's masks just shows that at best, you can find additional texture to his eyeball that's exposed, but that's it. However, Codename Gamma brought it to my attention that apparently on the Japanese website, the black bars that are at the top and bottom of the screens are not there for these cutscenes. And so a black bar that's supposed to cut off Infinite's face during this one with Shadow ends up showing what his face actually would look like. So in a small way, that's a boundary break. I just didn't have to do anything to make that happen. Now we got this boss fight with Eggman, and this is a classic Sonic boss battle fight, so everything is 2.5D. One of the most unusual things that I can't really explain for you is way above the character model for Dr. Robotnik and his flying machine, he's a second glass windshield. Now you might speculate that maybe it's used for his second form or something, but no, nope, doesn't seem to be used for that either. And speaking of that second form, if we take the camera behind the stage, we can see that exact moment in which the second form is spawned. We can also see how far away Eggman goes when he starts flying away. Back at Green Hill Zone with these giant enemy crabs, I wanted to show you something that I thought to be a little bit unusual. Now the game goes through the trouble of showing you the crab getting into position to drop its legs down on you into the foreground, but for no other reason than what I can imagine is the wrong width and length of the legs, or the rest of the body causing some sort of obstruction on the screen, the legs are completely detached from these crabs themselves. It's all just an illusion, folks. No, instead the two seem to coexist while the legs offer up the gameplay aspect. Also, here's a cool little fact to share with all your friends. All the springboards in Sonic Forces have a spike at the end of it. So even in aspects like this where the springboard just shows you the spring and the board, underneath the environment you can find the rest of the springboard at any given time. Thanks to Codename Gamma, we're able to look at an area that was only meant to be in a pre-rendered cutscene. What you're looking at right now is the lab area that Dr. Robotnik is supposed to be monologuing in, except in real time. So now we can manipulate the camera any way we want and take a much closer look at some of these objects that were only meant to be seen at certain angles. In the final boss battle, something really strange happened. Now what's really cool is that if you zoom the camera out, you can see these cubes that make up that effect that plays out during the final battle. But as we draw the camera further and further out, you can see that it's supposed to be a starry space themed skybox. And then outside of that skybox is another skybox. But what takes this whole thing into a turn for the uncanny is if we keep zooming the camera out, eventually the skybox on that space theme just turns into a completely different skybox. And the ending to Sonic Forces is pretty great in itself. If we were to remove all dynamic camera angles, you can see characters off screen doing weird contortions to their bodies. This happens to almost every single character in the cutscene, so feel free to take your pick on which goofy pose you want. After which there's supposed to be a scene with Sonic. So since the Sonic model has to be used at a certain point, they stored the Sonic model underneath this set piece. And then once it switches to that scene where you do meet Sonic, all the characters that you were just interacting with in that last scene are now underneath the stage in the new scene. And although it seems like Sonic's just running off into the city, after your character leaves the scene, Sonic just sort of teleports right back to the scene that he started at. Guys, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Codename Gamma. You definitely want to check out his video if you want to do this for yourself. As always, there's a link to that video down below. And here's a little teeny tiny preview in the little corner here of one of Channy and Kimberly's other animations. Again, I am absolutely in love with their channel. I definitely recommend you give it a shot. Got lots of stuff for Nintendo fans over there. And of course, if somehow you missed out on this channel and you haven't seen all the 500 other Sonic videos that I've done at this point. Uh, I'll leave a link to the best ones down below and of course I gotta do Sonic Generations and throw that on the screen right here so that makes it an easy click for you if you want that. But with that all said thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again. Take care.